When I was very young, I had a uh, great-grandma that we called Granny. And uh, she lived in this old beaten-down trailer uh, on the edge of the farmland. And Granny was, was very poor. Uh, and I don't think I'd remember any differently because Granny always had a special treat for us. She had this old ceramic jar that sat in her cupboard, and inside that jar were, were Granny's chocolate chip cookies. And honestly, they were not that great. Uh, the texture was like a rock, but the fact is they were Granny's treats, so we always enjoyed Granny's treats. Now, Christmas time came around, and my parents wanted to remind my sister and I that, you know, as we come to visit Granny, we needed to be mindful. Granny didn't have a lot of nice things. She didn't have a lot of money. And that we needed to understand that, that, that whatever she gave us came from a place of love. It wouldn't come from a, a place of wealth. And that whatever it was, we needed, to be, we needed to be thankful. And we needed to show her our thanks. So we get to Granny's house. The smell of the chocolate chips was there, and I can remember that. We greeted and hugged, and the presents were handed out, one for each of us. And Granny, Granny handed me this this box-shaped gift, and of course, as any kid would do, you shake it up, and then I started to tear away at the wrapping, and I started seeing a, a purple color and black words, and this picture began to show through the rips, Raisin Bran. <laughs> Raisin Bran. Raisin Bran! My favorite cereal! Oh, thank you, Granny. I, st I started to run toward Granny, and she was laughing, and she was saying, now, honey, honey, honey. Open the box. <laughs> so I sat back down and I opened the box, and there was the packages of the green and tan army men inside. Well, this time I actually was really excited, but <laughs> how do you up your game, right? Well, as I come to give her a hug, she said, Well, honey, I guess I reckon I know to get you cereal next time. <laughs> Whatever you get, be thankful. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand before you and, and bring a portion of, of God's Word. Uh, I, I will admit to you, this, this lesson is, is a work in progress, and I'm really just kind of presenting some surface ideas with it. Um, you know, nothing deeply theological, but just, just food for thought. I appreciate Luke reading the First Thessalonians passage there. You know... When we think about being thankful, there's, there's just all sorts of opportunities to be thankful. I think it's easy to stand up and, and state the obvious. You know, as we say, we're, we're thankful for our food. We're thankful for our homes. We're thankful for our families. We, uh, we are so thankful for the life of Christ. And those, those things are just amazing and great blessings that absolutely we should be thankful for. But I've been thinking a lot about kind of life experiences, all the things we go through or have been through that bring us to the here and now. Think about your life. Think about the things you did and the people you encountered, both positive and negative. Think about trials and tribulations. Think about loved ones that perhaps are no longer here. Think about your childhood, the decisions your parents made that affected you or are affecting you now, and the decisions you made in school, the decisions you make in work. All these decisions and all these experiences and how everyone, you know, we make different choices and we're influenced by other people and other events. All of our background is as unique as our thumbprint. And now, because of that life, you are who you are right now. Although every single event and decision separates us in our individual development, there was at least one choice that we made today that was the same, well, to be here. And thank God for that. I bring up all these events and I encourage you to focus on the moments when you were at your lowest. And you may ask, why? Why would I thank God for the most challenging moments in life? And that's kind of what I want to consider this morning. I'd like to consider difficult life experiences and some reasons that we can be thankful for them. And I'm going to start us off super calm and easy by considering giving thanksgiving for when we are tired. You know, there's a big difference between being tired just because we've been lazy all day versus when we are tired from an active day of work. 
And I'm speaking, of course, of being thankful for the hurt-so-good parts of life. You ever experienced that? Where you work really hard and you finally have a moment to rest from that work, but when you sit down, it's almost like painful, but it feels so good. Hurts so good. We have examples of moments when Bible characters rested from their labor. I mean, labor. This, this originates from the beginning of time, when God rested from His creation. But we see great examples even with Christ and His apostles. Be turning to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. This is following a series of teachings of the multitudes with parables. You know, Jesus tells His apostles that this time that He wants to cross to the other side of the water. And during that sail, a storm arose. And while the storm was raging on the sea, we see something kind of interesting here in Mark chapter 4, verses 37 and 38. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But He was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, as I consider that, I kind of wonder, how easy is it truly to fall asleep in a storm-tossed boat? I've never been in that situation. I don't know. Maybe some find that relaxing. But I would imagine, as I kind of consider everything that Jesus has been doing, as we consider Jesus' travels, as we consider his teaching, I wonder, that you seem like that would be something that's tiring? I, I bet so. You ever do any traveling? You ever do any public speaking? If you're at your daily work, just walking about, you're going to grow tired. The body wears down. Ask any preacher, local or traveling, if their work in teaching is tiresome. And they will probably say, yes, it's inspiring, it's uplifting, but it's tiring. Our bodies tire. I saw this firsthand with my dad through his life. He's preached over 40 years now, and he will still say that preaching is, is a tiresome work. It wears on you. It wears on the mind and the body, but it's also an uplifting work. But being exhausted from our work, I think especially as it pertains to the labor in the Lord's work, is truly a beautiful thing. A moment that I think we share both in commonality with what we see with Jesus and what we see with his apostles. If you move just a couple chapters later in Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6 around verse 31 there, this is sometime after Jesus sent the apostles out two by two. They returned to Jesus and they were telling him everything that they had done and taught. And we come to verse 31 Jesus says, come away, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. It says, for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Now, can you imagine having so many people interested in talking to you about the gospel that you couldn't even catch a break to eat? That's a pretty crazy thought. And and I know, like, when I think about my everyday work, if people are starting to impede on my lunchtime, there's a problem. This is lunchtime. Let's worry about work after lunchtime. Minimum 30 minutes, preferably an hour and a half, okay? We can talk about work after that. Jesus was busy doing the work of his Father, according to Acts 10, 37 and 38, and he and his apostles were attending to multitudes of fifties, hundreds, and thousands. Can you even imagine what they what that, what that would be like to look it up and, and see over the hilltop, family after family and group after group, multitudes of people eager to come and hear God's word. I would imagine that is a crazy adrenaline rush and exactly what they were hoping would happen. You wouldn't want to pass that up, would you? You're going to give it your all to teach and keep teaching as long as you can. But there's still a need for rest. He encourages his apostles to rest. And we can rejoice and be thankful that we experience fatigue because it is there to tell us and remind us that we have been active and working hard. And I think especially as it pertains to the work and example we set in godliness. And it also helps us appreciate the rest. When we lay down and rest and we arise refreshed, re-energized, alert, ready to go back at it again. 
The second thing I want to consider is being thankful for persecution. You know, being persecuted is a harsh thing. And when persecuted, it's common, I think, for people to feel you know, offended, demoralized, or even defeated. I want you to be turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy write to the Thessalonians showing thankfulness for their steadfastness through the persecutions that they endured. Even as we read just a couple verses here. You can read all the way through verse 12, but just in verses 3 and 4. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. I wonder, though, if during that specific time of persecution, it was such a thankful thought for the Thessalonians. I think it would be only natural for us to be in the mindset of, you know, why? Why am I going through this? Why am I having to put up with this? What, what have I done to deserve this? Rather than thinking the reason someone persecutes me is because I'm different than them. And it's in a way that either they're threatened by or maybe they disagree with. And that if I am being treated differently, it's because I am different. I am intentionally setting myself apart from the ways of the world. And I say, thank God that I experienced persecution to remind me of that. An example after example in the Bible, we have persecution in Scripture. We, we don't have time to look at all these, but just think about these stories. I think these are stories that, that, that rest on our minds that we remember easily. But you think about Moses and the Israelites enduring persecution and slavery. Daniel and the lion's den. That's a, that's a favorite childhood story. But, but think about what Daniel had to endure during that time. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego persecuted for standing for their God. Elijah with the prophets of Baal. Can you imagine that situation being one versus so many? Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Job, Jesus Christ. All these went through extreme and various persecutions. And all these historical events and lives, we read of these persecutions against believers and proclaimers of God, and God knows this. He knows that there will be persecutors, and He tells us what happened and continues to happen for those persecuted for Him. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 12 here. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Of course, persecution can feel defeating in this world. But when, it, when, when we come to our home, our places of comfort, when we come here or in homes of our brothers and sisters in Christ, let me ask you this. How much peace do you feel? That you don't have to put up with that persecution anymore. How uplifting is it? But without that persecution, we would not know how great it is to have this family of believers. We would not be pushed as much to lean on God, look into His Word, and know that we are blessed as we serve Him beyond what we encounter in this world. It's an interesting thought, I think, to consider. Being thankful for our persecution. The last one I'll look at is kind of a big one, and that is thankful for difficult times. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 reads, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, various, or meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Similar to what persecution can produce, difficult times in general will help us grow. These moments challenge our strength, 
our stamina, our faith, and our minds. And sometimes these difficulties cause us to be creative and think outside the box. But we experience difficulties in our families, in marriage, in raising children, in jobs, sports, school, and sometimes even in the church. But I'd ask you this, when? When we use sound judgment, when we use love and reasoning through God's Word, how often do we come out of those events weaker than when we entered them? I can't think of a time that that happens. These experiences, although difficult at the time, they they test us with fire. And if we make godly choices, use godly correction, and encourage godly love, we endure the testing and we come out refined. And knowing future difficulties will come, we can handle them because we've learned from our successes and failures. Now, I want to clarify something. Some difficulties come in greater magnitude and substantially impact us and our families' lives. So I'm not saying that we should be thankful that one gets diagnosed with cancer or that one loses a loved one. Those are extremely difficult things. But what I am saying that we can be grateful for in those times is the proximity that it brings us to God. The vulnerability that it places us to our Father in heaven and the closeness it brings us to the love, care, and prayers of our brothers and sisters in Christ. These things cannot be prevented, and they're very sad things, but if you think about those times and the ones you were able to lean on and depend on, how beautiful is that? Without difficulties, how do we learn and grow? How do we increase? How are we challenged? How are we brought together? I'm going to just skim over some of these verses here, but 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. James 5.16, pray for one another. Romans 12.12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Notice those are group efforts, multiple involved. If this has not been evident to you, especially as of late, then I think you're missing out. Think about, and I truly want you to think about this, think about the recent months, just the recent weeks even, of the amount of prayers lifted for families and individuals' requests because of difficult things. You consider the number on the board you consider that's probably not just one prayer led. That's hundreds of prayers being led for individuals. Brothers and sisters going through difficulties with family member health issues, physical and spiritual. Don't forget those. Sometimes we do. Brothers and sisters going through difficulties with an adoption. Brothers and sisters going through work changes that influence their families. That's not minor. Those are big things too. Brothers and sisters going through personal difficulties. We see the pain, and to some extent we can relate to each other with the pain these difficulties bring. But on the optimistic side, do we not have an incredible God who said He will hear our prayer? An incredible God that through providential care and mercy has brought us together to be supporters, to be uplifters, to be weight bearers, how beautiful it can be when we see through that, that chaos that our God and our family is surrounding us with love and care in those difficult times. Romans 5, 3 through 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit inspired it, Paul wrote it, you heard it and read it, God is 
upholding it. He lo- his love is poured out to us, and we can rejoice in whatever we face because of his love and promises. We serve an amazing God. Now, it will likely never be transparent at the moment, but I do think for the most part we can look back at these things, whether they were exhausting, whether they were harsh persecution, or maybe just a difficult situation. And if, if we can reflect on these moments, that if they brought us an appreciation or a reflection or they brought us into our brother's and sister's embrace, and especially if they brought us into God's embrace, then we can certainly be thankful for that. Thankful because it brings us closer to God. You say that personally. Thankful that it brings me closer to God. The lesson is yours, and this I'm going to conclude with, that... I am thankful for you, but listen closely. I am thankful for you when you challenge me with a difficult question. When you challenge me to check on those who need encouragement more, and when you challenge me to write to those who we support, I'm thankful when you keep me in check and hold me accountable. Those are not always easy things to talk through or work through with each other, But they improve us. Iron sharpens iron, right? I'm thankful that God's design limits us. He limits our time and reminds us of our frailty. And it humbles me. It humbles me to be more considerate and aware and appreciative of my short time with my wife and kids as well as the time I share with brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be more appreciative of this time. If you aren't a child of God, you are missing out on the experiences and blessings that come with a life you can live knowing that you have given yourself to God. Acknowledging that He is mine and I am His brings so much comfort. Earthly worries subside in the comfort of His arms. Struggles turn into blessings as we give our lives to Him. And I would say, don't put off being His anymore. Come forward at this time, and let us pray for you and with you as we stand and as we sing.